introduce our sorry uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first plenary speaker for the British Combinatorial Conference, which is Derek Osthus. So let me just say a few words about Derek. Derek um, did a study at Cambridge University before moving to Humboldt University Berlin for his PhD and postdoc years. He then in uh, 2004 moved to Birmingham, where he is until now. Derek has won a European Prize in Combinatorics in 2003 and uh, was invited to the ICM in 2014. And in the same year, he also won a Whitehead's Prize by the London Mathematical Society. Derek's research in uh, extremal combinatorics and probabilistic combinatorics has greatly influenced the, year, uh, the field over the years. Um, and he had a number of big results. And today he will tell us uh, about one recent such breakthrough. He will talk about the proof of the adish parba lovash conjecture. Okay, um, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, just as a check, you can hear me fine and see the slide, is that okay? Okay, good. Yeah, so it would have been nice to be in Durham. It's, it's a very nice place, uh, but I guess this is the way it is. So this is joint work with uh, Domya Khan, Tom Kelly, Daniela Kuhn and Abhishek Metuku, uh, who are all at the University of Birmingham. So this is a talk about uh, matchings and edge colorings and graphs and hypergraphs. So I guess you all know the re relevant definition, to just, but just to make sure, uh, a matching is a set of disjoint edges. And a proper edge coloring is a coloring of the edges so that if you have two edges of the same color, then they don't uh, share a vertex. And of course, then every color class is a matching. And you can view a proper edge coloring of a graph or a hypergraph as a decomposition of the edges into matchings. That's a very useful point of view, which we'll take on uh, later. And then the chromatic index of a graph or a hypergraph is the minimum number of colors that you need in a proper edge coloring. And you can view this as a scheduling problem, particularly as we're at a conference here. So the vertices would be people and the edges would be meetings between the people that you'd like to schedule. And then the chromatic index is the number of time slots, uh, the length of the conference that you need. So here's a graph example. And for graphs, uh, matchings and the chromatic index uh, is pretty well understood. So in particular, Biesing's theorem tells you that the chromatic index for a graph is always either delta or delta plus one, where delta is the maximum degree. So of course you need uh, at least delta colors because if you have a vertex, then all the edges at this vertex need to have different colors. And Biesing's theorem says uh, one more is certainly enough. So that pins it down pretty closely. Of course, determining uh, the chromatic index precisely whether it's delta or delta plus one is in general a very difficult problem. Now, these definitions also, as I already indicated, make sense for hypergraphs, where now we have edges consisting of more than, possibly more than two uh, vertices. So already uh, the problem of determining whether a hypergraph has a matching, a three uniform hypergraph has a matching of given size is NP complete. So here a uniform hypergraph means that we have all the edges of the same size. So here's an example of a three edge coloring of this hypergraph here. So we have a blue matching, a red, uh, pink matching and a green matching. And then, of course, determining the chromatic index is much harder than uh, determining uh, the maximum match size. Okay, and then we can now almost uh, get to the 
uh, main topic of this talk, just need one more definition. This is that of a linear hypergraph where every pair of vertices is contained in at most one edge. Another useful way of uh, thinking about this is whenever you have two hyper edges, then they meet in at most one vertex. Okay, so that's a linear hypergraph and the famous Erdrich faber lovas conjecture posed almost 50 years ago said uh, that if you have an n vertex linear hypergraph, then the chromatic index is at most n. So Edish said um, that this is one of, or was one of his favorite, uh, three favorite combinatorial problems. So he initially offered uh, $50 for a solution and then uh, raised this to um, $500. So um, the authors of this conjecture um, frequently told this, or sometimes told the story that they actually made this conjecture at a, at a party and then originally thought it might be solved the next day and then slowly realized its difficulty and um, which made uh, Erdush offer these successively uh, increasing cash prices. Okay, so uh, where does this M come from here in the chromatic index? Why is that a natural thing to conjecture? Well, here are actually three families of extremal examples. So the first one is the finite projective plane of order K. So you have, what is this? This is a K plus one uniform hypergraph. So each edge has size, consists of K plus one vertices. And you have roughly K squared vertices altogether and the same number of edges. And crucially, it's intersecting and linear. So it fits with the, so linear means it fits with the Erdős Fava Lovas conjecture and it's intersecting. So every two hyperedges do actually meet. So here's the projective plane of order two. So I hope you're impressed that I actually managed to incorporate the BCC logo into my talk. Uh, so we have seven edges and seven vertices and all the edges uh, pairwise meet. So we need to color them with different colors. So altogether, we need N colors here. Okay, uh, so here the edge size is a roughly square root of the number of vertices that we have. Then there's the degenerate plane. So we have one special vertex, which is connected to every other vertex by a graph edge of size two. And then one huge hyper edge consisting of n minus one uh, vertices. Now again, this is intersecting and it has n edges. So, and because it's intersecting, then we need a different color for each edge. So again, we get up to n. And the final example is that of a graph. So here, all the edges have size two and Suppose we have an odd number of vertices, and now suppose that the chromatic index is less than n. Well, we have n choose two edges, and if the chromatic index was less than n, then actually you can only, uh, this means that the colors classes would have to be perfect matching, so it would have to cover every single vertex. But it, you can only, of course, have a perfect matching if n is even. So for a complete graph of odd order, uh, we again we need n colors as you can see in this example, and it's not just three, these three uh, hypergraphs. So you can actually modify uh, the degenerate plane, and you can also modify the complete graphs. So you can um, make it almost complete in a certain way, and um, then you still have extremal examples. So this is already one indication that this conjecture is difficult uh, because you have these. Uh, three very different uh, examples where first we have edge sizes of edges of size square root n, then we have edge of size n minus one in the second example, and the third one it's something graph like. 
So they're very different and it's not just these examples, you can play around them with a bit and still have an example. Okay, so that's an interesting feature, these uh, rich families of extreme examples. Another interesting feature is that there's lots of formulations for this conjecture. And the first one I mentioned is the dual version. Excuse me, sir. So yeah, was that a question? Yes. Sir, yeah. uh, suppose you have multiple uh, lines crossing through single point. That is, I guess, that is also a linear hypergraph. And for uh, chromatic number for this will be the number of edges, not one. So I didn't quite hear that. Yes, yeah, so you could, um, you have multiple edges passing through a single point. You can have edges of size one. Is that your question? Yes. 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 So that's allowed in the conjecture. Actually, um, the first thing you do in the proof is basically, uh, if you can prove the conjecture without uh, singleton edges, then there's a one line proof uh, or a two line proof that's the, the general conjecture follows. So actually, so in this conjecture, we allow singleton edges. When I go to the proof sketch, actually, um, uh, we will ignore singleton edges. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Um, yeah, so another nice feature is there's um, different formulations and the, this uh, dual formulation is the following. Suppose that we have an n edge linear hypergraph with all edges of size at most n. And then you can color the vertices with n colors so that if you look at an edge, then the vertices inside this edge are distinct colors. So they're injectively colored or rainbow, whatever. So here, suppose we have an input for the original conjecture. Then if um, why is this new conjecture, the dual one, actually equivalent to the original one? Well, you can pass from an input, this five vertex input to the original conjecture to a dual hypergraph where the edges go to vertices. So this gray three uniform edge E goes to this single vertex E and the black edge F goes to this single vertex F. And vertices go turned into hyper edges and a dual edge like this four uniform edge at the left bottom consists of all the original edges incident uh, to the original vertex. So the original vertex would be this x, this is turned into this um, hyper edge containing all the uh, original edges incident to this vertex f, in uh, x, in particular it contains f. And then you can check that a proper edge coloring in the dual uh, in the original corresponds to a, the required vertex coloring in the dual. And you can also check that linearity is preserved. Okay, so that's one formulation. Uh, you can also uh, get a very, oh, so here's an example where you actually color things. Uh, so this hyper edge, if you color it blue, uh, gets turned into this blue vertex here. And you can check this coloring um, of the dual hypergraph satisfies the dual version of the edish fabulous conjecture. Okay, and then you can formulate this one, the dual version, as a set theoretical formulation, where you now have sets of size at most n. So here we would have this set A1 of size four. And so that these sets are almost disjoint. And for any, and then you can actually color the vertices in these sets with n colors so that each color appears at most one in each side, each of these sets. So this is clearly equivalent to the dual version above. And then there's another formulation that I'd like to mention. This is probably the most uh, well-known um, because it's kind of uh, simple to state. So this is the graphic version. Suppose that you have a graph 
which is the union of n complete graphs, each one at most n vertices, so that every pair of complete graphs shares at most one vertex, then the chromatic number of this graph is at most n. So of course, the chromatic number of a graph is uh, the number of colors you need to color the vertices so that adjacent vertices have different colors. And this you get from the original formulation by going to the line graph of the original edge, probably, uh, edge coloring problem. So if this was an input for the original problem, then you turn edges into vertices and edges sharing into a vertex get turned into adjacent vertices and then a proper edge coloring gets turned into a proper vertex coloring. And then you can see here, uh, you had uh, five cliques in this example, one bottom left, one bottom right of size four and four triangles uh, one, no, three triangles, and each of these cliques, each of these five cliques uh, meets in just one vertex. So this is a formulation I put, for instance, on my example sheet in graph theory as, uh, as the um, last problem. I actually got a solution once a year later, but it turned out to be wrong. Okay, and there are more formulations, but I think that's enough. So, uh, let me finish this uh, introduction to the problem with a quote by Paul Erdős, which says that an innocent looking problem often gives no hint as to its true nature. It might be like a tasty marshmallow, or it might be like an acorn, uh, which actually grows into something bigger. And I think this is a problem which kind of looks like a marshmallow, and I hope to convince you that it's actually uh, more of an acorn. Okay, so what's the history of the problem? So with a direct approach, you can show, get a bound of at most two n minus three. And this is very simple. You order the edges according to size and the largest edge comes first and the smallest edge comes last. And then you color the, the edges largest first greedily with the first available color. And then you can show that at each stage, the number of colored neighbors of an edge, namely ones that intersect uh, the given edge that you're trying to color is at most two N minus four. And um, then uh, you have one more color available. The, the, this two N minus three is attained for the complete graph where the, if you have an edge, then it actually meets two n minus four edges. But of course, uh, for a complete graph, you can do things better. So Chang and Lawler built on this approach uh, to uh, get a bound of three n over two. Okay, and then there's an approach of uh, sort of proving weaker results or using stronger assumptions. So there's the famous De Bruyne-Erdős theorem, uh, which predates the conjecture and says that if you have an intersecting hypergraph, then you have at most edges. And so clearly the chromatic index is at most n. And Seymour showed uh, there's a matching of size, at least number of edges divided by n. This is a natural bound, which actually follows from the conjecture, because if you have a coloring with at most n colors, then one color class, which is a matching, must have size at least number of edges divided by n. Okay, and then Kahn and Seymour uh, proved a fractional version of this conjecture. So um, they gave the correct bound, but for the fractional chromatic index. And then there's an approach by a the uh, So this is a very general theorem, which says that if you have any linear hypergraph, or implies that if you have any linear hypergraph, and the bound edge sizes are bounded, some fixed number k, and the maximum degree is at most delta, maximum vertex degree, then the chromatic index 
is at most delta plus little o of delta. So it's a bit like Wiesing's theorem. Uh, so Wiesing would have a plus one in the error term, and here we have a little o of delta error term. So this is a very powerful general result, which is proved by a probabilistic approach, which I'll come back to later. Basically, you build your coloring randomly in lots of little nibbles. Okay, and what's the relation to the edges faber lobos conjecture? Well, it directly implies it if you assume that your edges uh, sizes have size between three and k, where um, you think of k being fixed. Why is that? Well, if you have all edge sizes being at least three, so you have no graph edges, then a vertex, if it's an incident to an edge of size three, that kind of takes up two other vertices. And so the maximum degree can only be at most n over two. And so uh, Edith Fabalovas is true in this case uh, with lots of room to spare. Okay. And it also implies an approximate version of the conjecture if we allow graph edges, um, but all edge sizes have to be bounded by some k. Why is that? Because in this case, the maximum degrees at most n uh, actually, and actually n minus one, and then we get this little error term. Okay, now building on this, uh, a breakthrough of Kahn uh, gave that uh, we can get the same approximate result for any input. So we have a chromatic index n plus a little o of n error term. And much more recently, Farber and Harris um, proved that if we restrict ourselves to edge sizes between three and something smaller than, significantly smaller than square root n, then the edish Farber is also true. So uh, why this bound here? Well, edge size is at least three means you um, don't have graph edges. So this kills off the com complete graph extremal example and the degenerate plane. And staying below square root n means that you're far away from a projective plane. And both of these uh, use a um, strengthening of the Pippinger-Spencer theorem where you uh, look at the list chromatic index of H. Okay, so that's, uh, there is more history, but this is uh, all I wanted to mention. So now we come to our result, which says that for sufficiently large n, every n vertex linear hypergraph has chromatic index at most n. So the edrish faber lovas conjecture holds for all sufficiently large n, which means that we confirm the conjecture for all but finitely many hypergraphs. So this is our main result. Uh, along the way, uh, we prove a stability result, which was kind of predicted by Kahn, which in some sense, uh, in a weak sense, says that the three extremal families I showed you are the only ones. So it says that if you have an n vertex linear hypergraph, where the maximum degree is at most one minus delta times n, so this assumption means that you're not close to a clique and that you're not close to a degenerate plane. And you also assume that you have significantly less than n edges of size roughly square root n. This assumption means you're not close to a projective plane. And you can actually color with significantly less than n colors. Okay, so uh, this was the introduction. So now I'd like to say uh, something about the proof. And I will mainly say something about the proof where all edge sizes are two or three. So this introduces a significant amount of the difficulties, but of course not all. 
But it's easy to extend this argument to bounded edge sizes. So think of a bound the most 10 on the edge sizes, then it's also um, this argument also works in a similar way. So we want to color the edges of H. And we are going to do this by uh, viewing as this as a decomposition problem, where we repeatedly uh, remove matchings and try to decompose H in this way. And these matchings form color classes. And what's the guiding motivation? Well, this uh, is the following, which follows from the linearity of H. Suppose we have a vertex of high degree, and high degree means very close to M. Then this vertex needs to be covered by almost all of the matchings. So like here. So this is, looks difficult. But if we know that the vertex is high degree, then the edges incident to this vertex, essentially all of them must be graph edges. They must have size two. As soon as you have size three edges, then you can't have too many of them at this vertex. Okay, but we know a lot about graphs. So maybe we can color the edges at this vertex with graph theoretic rotation. So that gives you some hope. What about the other vertices? So if a vertex is incident to many edges of size three, then as I already indicated, this can only happen if it has low degree and low, I mean now um, three quarters n or something, or actually one, at most one minus epsilon times n. And this means that when we choose our matchings, occasionally we can say, oh, let's not bother including this vertex or covering this vertex in this matching that we're currently building. We can be reasonably flexible about this. And this gives you hope. So um, these vertices are difficult because they're incident to hyper edges and hyper edges are kind of scary, but there aren't too many of them and so we can ignore them sometimes. Okay, so with this in mind, uh, let's now move to our three line dream proof that we, or approach that we'd like to follow. We do a two phase approach where in the first phase, somehow we're going to partially color H so that all the size three edges are colored. So we only have graph edges left and for each vertex, at least half of the graph edges containing it are colored. Okay, so what do we know then about the leftovers? We can somehow magically do, do this. Well, then the leftover is a graph and it has small maximum degree. So uh, originally it had degree at most n minus one and half of the graph edges are left and none of the hypergraph at size three edges are left. So the remaining maximum degrees n minus one over two, which is less than n minus k. And so by the easiest theorem, we have a graph of maximum degree less than n minus k, so we can cover it with n minus k colors. We've already used k colors, so we're finished. Okay, so we don't know how to do this, but this is our kind of guiding um, strategy. Uh, we'll try to emulate this strategy by the probabilistic methods by proving something which comes close. So we fix parameters gamma and epsilon, which is small, and we let u be the graph-like vertices. So the vertices whose degree is very high, close to n. And our aim is now to use slightly more than n over two colors. And as in the dream proof, we want to color all the size three edges colored and then for each vertex, we want to color nearly half of the graph edges. So this is slightly weaker than in our dream proof. To compensate for this, we want to have that every color class in this preliminary coloring uh, covers all the vertices of U. So we get perfect, that's what we call perfect coverage of U. So this is to compensate uh, for this uh, using more colors and um, only color, coloring less, slightly less than half of the graph edges. 
So I'm not telling you yet how we can do this. Um, so here's a bit more about then how this would work. So we're slowly fleshing out uh, this green proof and then the aim. So we first put each graph edge into a random reservoir independently with probability a half. Then we know uh, that the maximum degree of the leftover, not in the reservoir, is certainly less than n over two because um, we, oops, so this, this leftover has a degree at most n over two. It's uh, not hard to show that. And then if the leftover has degree at most n over two, then by the Pippinger-Spencer theorem, the leftover has um, chromatic index at most n over two plus a little bit. So together with coloring the reservoir, uh, we could color the whole thing with n plus a little bit many colors, which is not good enough for us. So what we want to do is we want to strengthen the oops, uh, Pippinger-Spencer theorem by something which could be viewed as absorption. So we use our K colors to color um, everything that's not in the reservoir and achieve this perfect coverage. If we can do this somehow, then we're back to our dream proof strategy because a vertex in U originally had degree most n minus one. Perfect coverage means it's in every color class. So its degree goes down by one each time. So minus K is our leftover degree. And so this is strictly less than N minus K. Sounds good. What about the vertices not in U? Well, they originally had degree by definition at most and one minus epsilon times n. And because of the random reservoir, uh, this goes down to um, n over two, uh, one minus epsilon times n over two plus some little error term. And because of the order of the constants that we chose, this is also um, n minus k. So, what we have, if we can magically do this, uh, red step, strengthening the Pippinger's theorem by absorption, then what we have is a graph. And because it lies in the reservoir, we've colored um, all the non reservoir edges. And the maximum degree, as I said, is less than n minus k. So we can go back to this dream proof strategy, apply Wiesing's theorem to the leftover and um, use K colors in this, uh, strengthening the Pippinger-Spencer theorem step and then N minus K colors by Wiesing and then we reached N. Okay, so I still haven't told you how to do this. There are several problems with this approach. Uh, so one is, uh, you can't actually achieve perfect coverage. Because if you have a complete graph of odd order, then every vertex is a graph-like vertex. And uh, one vertex must always be left over. So what we do is we go for the next best thing, which we call nearly perfect coverage. So every color class covers all but one vertex of these graph-like vertices. And each vertex uh, of U is, gets left out at most once. And then you can go through the above argument and then this costs you an extra color. So we're not quite getting down to N and I'm not going to tell you how to get down to N uh, we actually use um, indirectly some results on Hamilton decompositions of graphs, which Daniel and I proved a few years earlier. Okay, so 
the overall strategy seems to work if we can magically uh, find the strengthening of the Pitchpinger's Benzer theorem, which achieves this uh, perfect or near, nearly perfect coverage. And to prove this, uh, we combine the random nibble approach, which proves the Pippinger Spencer theorem with absorption. So, what we do is want to uh, build each color class via a random process, where you, which you think of as one by one or in little batches or nibbles. You randomly select disjoint uncolored edges, which are not in the reservoir. And these form a large matching uh, M. But this might not have nearly perfect coverage. So then you have an additional step, which absorbs the vertices in U into your matching. And in this additional step, you find an additional matching, which is disjoint from the middle one, uh, to nearly cover U, nearly perfectly cover U. So here's an illustration. So first the nibble step, we randomly select some edges. And of course, uh, this might not be a matching. So if we have a conflict, well, we randomly select a small number of edges, and then we expect it to look close to a matching. And then if we have a conflict like this one here, two edges intersecting in a vertex, we just throw away uh, these two edges. And then we have uh, a small matching. So we keep this, uh, this is looking good. And then we randomly select some edges in the remainder. And then a small set of edges. And then we throw away conflicts that we have and then we will have few conflicts because we only selected a small number of edges. And then we keep going. And eventually we get a large matching. And then there's a certain point where we, this no longer works. Uh, but the nice thing is that just before this point, the set of uncovered vertices looks like a random set of vertices, just like what you would have got by just randomly um, selecting a few vertices. So we have a large matching, which leaves a small random set uncovered. But remember, our task is now to achieve nearly perfect coverage of U. Uh, so somehow we need to cover these vertices here. But this is one point where the reservoir comes in. Uh, we can now use reservoir edges to do this. And if this small white blob is large, uh, oh, it's the other way around. If this small white blob is small, then we're going to use Hall's theorem using reservoir edges. These blue edges are going to be reservoir edges to cover uh, the remaining white bit of U. And this is where we need that the reservoir is a graph because uh, we can use Hall's theorem and graph theoretical techniques to do this absorption step. And if the small blob is large, then we find the matching like this. So the nibble step, uh, step covers all the hypergraph edges, and then the absorption step uses just graph edges. Well, eventually the nibble step will use all hypergraph edges. So this is just our first matching. We keep it, and then we do a second matching with small nibbles. And then we have a small blob uncovered, and we get nearly perfect coverage of you by using the random reservoir again, readers. And then we keep going until all the hypergraph edges are covered and you can prove that um, we have these uh, properties of our dream proof and the remainder is a graph of small degree, which we can color via Wiesing's theorem. So first nibble, then absorption, and then at the end, coloring via graph theoretical techniques. Okay. So actually, uh, we don't choose our uh, matchings one by one. We actually choose the matchings in, in, in batches. Uh, but uh, this is going perhaps too far into the technicalities uh, of the proof. 
So here's just one uh, illustration of how it looked um, for a while on Zoom. But I'd like, like to stop here with the details of this part of the proof, because it's only half of the proof. Uh, we only looked at edges of size two and three. You can do something similar for edges of size up to 10 or something, say, or large constant. But what about very large edges? Um, so here's just going to be one slide about what happens for very large edges. So now let's go to the other extreme. Suppose we have all edges being very large, large being a large constant. Now let's look at an edge. And let's go back to this ordering where we um, order edges according to size, largest first. And this, then this ordering, um, we have how many edges, other edges preceding E, um, which intersect E. Well, let's look at E. Let's look at a vertex in E. Let's look at how many edges could be incident to this vertex X. Well, these edges are at least as large as E. So they have to have, because of linearity, at least size of E minus one vertices outside of E. And because of linearity, these size of E minus one edges have, uh, vertices have to be disjoint for each edge incident to X where X lived in E. Okay, so there can only be, since the whole universe has size N vertices, and we've already used at E, size of E um, for E, then the number of edges of size at least E incident to this vertex um, can be at most N minus size of E divided by size of E minus one. We have size of E vertices in E, and then the E's almost cancel, but goes slightly the wrong way around. Uh, so now we are up to something which is slightly bigger than M. But that's good, it looks promising. With a fairly trivial argument, we've got that the chromatic index of H is at most N plus some little O of N. So perhaps then this is what you start, this is what you think of immediately. So uh, perhaps then since we get so close, can we modify this ordering a little bit to get just below N? Uh, thing is, you can't. So if uh, you take linear hypergraphs which arise from Steiner systems, uh, then these show you uh, that it doesn't work. But um, we prove something which we call the reordering lemma, which says that um, if you can't get a good ordering, uh, that we, then we get some structure. So the aim is that we'd like to have a good ordering where we get below N um, for the number of edges which precede E, because then we could color with N colors. Uh, what we prove is this. So if we can't modify this size monotone ordering, then we get structure. And structure means either we are very close to being a projective plane, In other words, the line graph of H is close to being a complete graph on N vertices. Uh, or the line graph of H looks quasi-random, where quasi-random means that it's locally sparse. So you don't have too many edges clustered uh, in the neighborhood of a vertex. And so in this case where we have structure, we can actually color the line graph of H efficiently uh, via graph theoretical and probabilistic techniques. So there are famous results which actually efficiently vertex color um, locally sparse graphs, and this translates back to a good um, edge coloring of the original hypergraph. And um, so the nice thing is then in the small edge case, we reduce the problem to a graph problem, and in the large edge case, which is done, yeah, and in the large edge case, we also reduce the problem to a graph coloring problem. And in each case, 
we have lots of probabilistic techniques involved. Okay, so to summarize, what do we know? We can color the small edges, so edges of size at most some constant with n colors. We can color the large edges with n colors. And chromatic index is sub additive, so we can color the whole hypergraph with n plus n equals 2n colors, which unfortunately, after all this work, is worse than the trivial bound. So uh, there would be some people that would be probably not impressed, and um, it's not actually looking that good. So how can we, uh, in the remaining time, go back to n colors? Well, actually, we do this in two phases. Where in the first phase, uh, we color all the large edges and with n colors, but we add some bells and whistles to this coloring with foresight. Um, it has some additional strong properties. For instance, every color class is small uh, in some sense. So we don't um, have too many hyper edges in a small in each color class. And then we color all the small edges, but we do it with the same color set and we avoid color conflicts with the large edge coloring. So we, um, if some vertices were already colored with red, then these vertices are not going to be colored with red in the small edge coloring. And again, we use the random nibble and absorption pro process uh, for this, but of course we have to be more careful to show that it actually works. Okay, so this completes uh, the proof sketch. So I'll finish with two open problems. So <clears throat> they both generalize the edrish faber lobos conjecture. And the first one is to Berge, Fureri, and Maniel, where we start again with the linear hypergraph. And the chromatic index of this linear hypergraph should be at most this expression there. And what is this expression? Well, we look at every vertex and look at all the edges containing this vertex, and then look at all the vertices in there and maximize all the all vertices, and this is our color set that were a uh, number of colors that were allowed. So here's an example. Uh, so for instance, we have a hypergraph, and the bottom left vertex here uh, is incident to this size three edge and this size four edge, and together they contain five uh, vertices. So that means in this example, this expression is five. Uh, why does this imply Wiesing's theorem? Well, in a graph, uh, basically this expression then counts uh, the number of edges incident to V uh, plus one, uh, so exactly for V, uh, exactly Wiesing's theorem, and it applies the erdos faber conjecture because this expression here is of course almost, always at most the total number of vertices that you have, which is um, n. So this is a beautiful uh, conjecture. And uh, another generalization of the Erdos Faber Lovas conjecture is a list version. So we have the same assumption, but now instead of chromatic index, we look at the list chromatic index, and this should be at most n. So for each edge, we have a list of colors of size n at least. And then we want to properly edge color as before, but we want to use for E the color from its list. And if you follow the proof of Kahn's results on the EFL conjecture, which gave a bound of n plus little o of n, then this actually works uh, for the list chromatic index as well. So we know this conjecture is true with n plus little o of n, but it's open uh, for n. Okay, so I hope 
I'm convinced you there's actually an acorn there, but I don't have to, time to talk, talk about the whole oak. So let me finish by just uh, giving you these two pointers. Uh, so, of course, there's more on the background in the actual paper, and the paper has an overall proof sketch. And then recently, last week, we put a survey on archive, uh, which has more related open problems, and also gives a more detailed sketch of the two um, aspects that I outlined in my talk. So edges of size two and three, and uh, coloring uh, hypergloss where all the edges are large. And then, uh, so as I said, Erdos Fabalovas can be viewed as a decomposition problem. The original title for this talk was uh, Extreme Aspects of Graph and Hypergraph Decomposition Problems. And uh, there's more um, de uh, problems and proof sketches uh, on more design theoretical uh, related problems in this um, survey. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention, uh, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, let's unmute ourselves to uh, thank Derek for his talk. Good. We have enough time for for some some short questions, and then that will officially finish the talk, but after that, there will be more time for in-depth discussion for people who want to stay for this. But let's start with some short questions. Okay, so let, let me uh, start with a question. Uh, so Derek, um, so, so can you say uh, just a little bit more how you get from this N plus one to N? Okay, um, so basically uh, the, um, the plus one was got by, we had a leftover of maximum degree uh, less than n of some number, uh, so less than n minus k, and then we just applied Wiesing's theorem and the Wiesing theorem uh, added this plus one. And so basically to get, to get rid of this, n plus one, we color more cleverly and try to get the lower bound in Wiesing's theorem, so the delta. And for this, we use that the graph has, um, if we don't have any leeway in the maximum degree, uh, then the leftover looks like a quasi-random graph. And um, then we can use uh, results about one factorizing quasi-random graphs, which are regular into perfect matchings, uh, if they have even order. So this we did with Stefan Bloch and uh, Daniela. And these in turn follow from a uh, result of Daniela and myself, where you say if you have a regular quasi-random graph, then it has a Hamilton decomposition if it's even regular. And uh, okay. the Hamilton cycle gives you two perfect matchings, um, so you have two colored glasses. So that was um, a nice lucky coincidence. Good, thank you very much. There's also one question in the chat which asks, do you have an explicit bound when n is sufficiently large in your theorem? Okay, um, so the answer, uh, the short answer is no. Uh, the <laughs> Uh, the longer answer is uh, that we um, try to, uh, in the way we wrote up the paper, uh, try to uh, make the arguments uh, as clear as, as possible. Uh, so in, for this, it's useful to just have an um, implicit constant and just to be able to say we choose a constant gamma, which is smaller than, much smaller than epsilon, rather than working out that gamma is um, at most epsilon cubed times log epsilon or something. There is inherently uh, some N0 that we use. Um, for instance, we would need some N0, uh, for instance, when we apply Chernoff's theorem to split off the reservoir, we want that with non-zero probability we have 
these pro nice properties of the reservoir. And so we'll need some uh, bound on the end. So um, when Abhishek, when he gave a talk, um, he said that if you're really, really careful with everything, um, then you can get away with a thousand. I think that's, I'll just take that as a quote from him. Uh, uh, I have no uh, idea how, um, how close down you can, uh, you can push this argument. But if you try, uh, then things would get much uglier. Um, well, things would get ugly. I would actually think that they're not ugly at the moment. All right, thank you very much. So let's uh, unmute ourselves again and thank uh, Derek again for his talk. Uh, and as I said, so this now finishes the talk and uh, kind of the contributed sessions will continue at half past 10 uh, London time, sorry, UK time. <laughs> uh, but we, we will stick around a little bit here for more in-depth discussion if anybody has any more in-depth questions. Thank you. <laughs>